So good afternoon. Um, this afternoon I have the pleasure of speaking to you about a topic that I think is critically important and that no one taught me in medical school. Um, I started uh, teaching about this topic about 10 years ago. And I think I really couldn't have begun to teach about it if I didn't think that there were things that we could do to nourish our health, that we could do to reduce our exposures to the environmental chemicals that I think are creating risk for us. So I'll just start with a question. Are any of you worried about this? Is anyone concerned? Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. So. I am going to be sharing some things today that are indeed quite concerning. At the same time, my goal is to give you a lot of practical tips of things that you could do to reduce your exposures and to reduce your personal risks of these chemicals. Now, I think ideally our government would help us as well, um, and I would like to suggests that we all advocate in ways that we can. I think we can be very effective at times in our local communities, sometimes in states, um, and hopefully one day in our federal government as well. So I also know that I'm going to be telling you about stuff that's going to probably make you feel a little anxious. So I want to say from the get-go that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Every single one of us on this cruise took some risks to get here. We probably flew in an airplane. Uh, we got into cars. We got into perhaps buses. All of these things entail risk. Every single day in your life, you do something that entails risk. And so, yes, these environment pose some risks for us, but it doesn't have to be an overwhelming risk. So what we want to do is we want to do the best job we can do without making ourselves feel crazy or frightened. I'm going to start by telling you about a patient that I saw uh, now a couple of years ago. She was a 44-year-old woman who came to see me because she was having two problems. One was early menopausal symptoms. She was having terrible hot flashes, very heavy menstrual bleeding. She couldn't sleep well. Uh, she was someone who was um, a professional, ran a company, and it interfered with her work. And so it was distressing to her. Now, the average age of menopause is 51. So 44 is young, but it does happen sometimes that people become menopausal at 44. She had this other symptom, which is called um, erythema nodosum. And I have a picture for you here on the slide. It's these painful red bumps that appear at the front of people's shins. And we often don't know what causes these. In my patient's particular situation, she had first had these bumps when she was pregnant at age 30. That pregnancy had ended in a miscarriage, and then she had two more successful pregnancies when she was in her early 30s, and with each pregnancy, she once again had erythema nodosum. And then a number of years passed, and she had this very strange inflammatory illness that was never fully understood, but she had terrible aches and pains and pleurisy, chest pain. And um, eventually, she went to see um, a naturopathic doctor who made a variety of lifestyle change recommendations to her. She followed those, and those symptoms began to disappear. And with it, that flare of erythema nodosum that she had had also went away. So in her mind, she came to see me in my office wondering, could this early menopause and these painful red bumps on my shins somehow be linked, and what could be causing it? Well, I'll tell you, I saw her in my office, and I took a very careful history. We we're fortunate. We spend about 90 minutes with a new patient taking a long, in-depth history. I recommended that she have some lab work done. I asked her to keep what I call a symptom record, which is to write down when she notices the symptoms and if she could think about anything that may have triggered them, how severe they are, et cetera. And um, I also promised her that I was going to speak with my colleague, who's an immunologist, to ask if he had any other ideas. And I said we would speak on the phone in two weeks. So two weeks later, I called her up and she said, I figured it out. Very important. She figured it out, right? She was the detective. And this is what she told me. She said that about three weeks before she had begun to have these symptoms, she had hired a new employee. And this woman had brought a cracked old plastic 
kettle to work with her, and every day she made coffee in the office, and my patient had gotten into the habit of drinking coffee from that hot plastic kettle. And so she realized, because she was kind of savvy about environmental things, that maybe she was getting plastic in the hot acidic water and that that was contributing to her symptoms. She went off of the um, coffee. She brought a stainless steel French press into uh, her office and began to make coffee in that, and her symptoms went away. And this is what she emailed me a few weeks later. I'm feeling much better since I saw you and eliminated the daily coffee made with toxic plastic. It feels great, but also odd to think that the culprit may have been something that simple. I have no new erythema nodosum. My last menstrual cycle was completely normal, very little premenstrual syndrome, normal flow, et cetera. Also, the flat, hot flashes have improved a lot. They're not gone completely, but my sleep is not interrupted anymore. So who thinks that it was really the kettle? Raise your hand. And who's a skeptic and goes, yeah, right? Okay, so in medicine, we have this idea, which is uh, called a test-retest. So to prove to the skeptics that this was really what was causing her symptoms, what I needed to do is say, go drink some coffee from that kettle again, and let's see if the erythema nodosum comes back. Who believes I did that? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys don't have much faith in me. I did not do that. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you what happened. So um, a few months after that, there was an article that was published in PLOS. And this article basically said that early menopause may be common due to endocrine disrupting chemicals. So it was part of the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which the CDC does. Almost 32,000 women were surveyed and they looked at their urine. And the women who had high levels of phthalates, which comes from plastics, PCBs, which you may get in fish sometimes, uh, DDE, that that's a metabolite of uh, DDT. We no longer have DDT, but we still have its metabolites in our environment. So the women who had the higher levels of these chemicals in their urine had menopause two to four years earlier. Now, you might say, well, great, you know, no more you know, periods, that can be a hassle, and, you know, I feel fine. But from a public health perspective, if women go into menopause earlier, there's going to be more heart disease, there's going to be more bone loss, more osteoporosis. And also, if you're wanting to be uh, a mother and you go into menopause earlier, you're, you're, you're done. Your fertility uh, period is over. So I thought my patient, who was a very educated woman, would find this article interesting. And so I emailed it to her. And this is what she emailed me back. And I know it's long, but it's interesting, so I'm going to read it. I'm still doing really well. Most of the major symptoms that prompted my visit with you are gone. The other is minor night sweats are manageable. One interesting anecdote. I've had no erythema nodosum since I eliminated the plastic kettle, except once after I made that change, I ate one of those frozen meals in a plastic bowl. I know, I know, but I put the frozen food in a glass bowl, heated it up that way in the microwave, then for just five seconds zapped the frozen sauce that was in the bottom of the plastic bowl so I could remove it from the plastic and add it to my dish. Within two hours, I had an erythema nodosum on my shin. It was a pretty weird feeling to notice how quickly it happened. It went away in a couple of days, nothing as persistent as the ones I'd been struggling with for years, haven't had one since. So she did the test retest. <laughs> she did it by exposing herself. Now, I'm going to tell you that I believe that my patient is particularly sensitive. I don't think that everybody who had that kind of teeny little exposure would probably have had a relapse of the symptoms. I also want to say that we're all exposed to environmental chemicals, and we all have a certain amount of them in our bodies. We know that. But think of it a little bit like a pond. You know, if there's a little bit of water at the bottom of the pond, it's not going to overflow the banks. It's not going to cause problems. But if you keep filling the pond with more and more water or metaphorically, more and more chemicals, at some moment, it's going to spill over the banks, and that's when you're going to have the trouble. That's when you're going to have symptoms. And a lot of things that we 
accept as normal in our society, things that we just think, well, there's a lot of, for example, Steve just talked about uh, heart disease and high blood pressure. We know that if you are exposed to bisphenol A or BPA, you have more high blood pressure. Where do you get exposed to BPA from? Water bottles, plastic water bottles. Where else? Line the canning, uh, the lining of cans often is lined with BPA. Another common source that you should know about. Where else? Thermal receipts. So when you pump your gas and then it says, would you like a receipt? And the receipt comes out, that is coated with bisphenol A. And we absorb it really well from our skin. So when someone says, would you like a receipt for that? What should you say? Exactly. Breast cancer. We believe that a lot of the increased breast cancer we're seeing in our society may in part be due to exposure to these environmental chemicals, many of which act in the body in an estrogenic way. Uh, Sandy talked about increasing ADHD. This is the increases in autism. And we have dramatic increases in autism. Most people believe that the environmental exposures, perhaps in utero, perhaps when mom is still pregnant, may be contributing. Who's heard of obesogens? You know, everybody loves to say, well, just eat less and exercise more. But you know that children who have the larger amounts of BPA in their urine have significantly increased rates of obesity? So maybe it's just getting them to stop having canned food and plastic bottles. They don't usually get receipts. But you know, maybe it would just be something as easy as that, as removing some of the environmental exposures. So what we know is that these chemicals act as endocrine disruptors. They disrupt our hormones and the normal function of our hormones. And that can be estrogen, male hormones, which are called androgens, thyroid hormone, cortisol, insulin signaling, all of these different hormones are affected by these different chemicals. And the chemicals are common. I mentioned BPA. Phthalates are in plastics. They're in a lot of cosmetics. They make plastics more flexible. It's easier to put your makeup on or your nail polish on because it's smoother. Fragrance. Anything that says fragrance, that's a code word. Industry is allowed to put anything in it they want. So you want to avoid fragrances as much as you can. And that's both perfumes, but also things that have fragrance in them. Like you ever get into a cab and they have that little uh, tree? I mean, that kind of artificial chemical is this kind of endocrine disruptor. And some pesticides. So we get exposed a lot. There are a lot of chemicals, they're mostly not tested, and we're exposed throughout our lifetime, and we gather these things in our bodies, in our fat, and this is the troubling news. I promised you good news, it's gonna come soon. Um, the, um, the rule of to toxicology uh, by Paracelsus is the dose makes the poison. In other words, when you're exposed to more, it's more likely to cause hazard. But in this particular field, it may be the timing that is most concerning. So it may be that during moments like pregnancy, both for the mom and for the fetus, or young children, that we place these individuals at the greatest risk. And that's because when you think about a fetus or a young child, they're still developing. Their neurological system is developing, their immune system is developing, and they're not as good at detoxification. And we're gonna talk some more about detoxification towards the end of the talk. And also, pound for pound, kids eat more. So if they're eating food that has pesticides, they're getting more of it. Also, kids live a life that exposes them to more chemicals. So for example, you have that baby crawling around the floor. Dust holds a lot of these chemicals. Um, you have a baby who then picks something up off the floor. What do they do? They put it right in their mouth, right? And that exposes them to more chemicals. So some of their... Um, you know, normal activities are going to expose them more than an adult. And so you can get a HEPA vacuum. You can reduce the amount of both dust, but also of these tiny particles if you have the right system. 
The other thing is, is that we're all different. And we're different because we've had different exposures. So I'll give you an example. A colleague of mine, one of the fellows of our uh, center, uh, had breast cancer premenopausal. Now, she was a really healthy woman. She ate organic food. She had studied to be a yoga teacher. And she's like, why? Why do I have this breast cancer when I've really lived a healthy lifestyle? And as she started to think about her past history and the things she had done, she remembered that when she and her brother were kids, they had this game. They lived on Long Island, and they used to watch the little planes, the crop dusters, fly over and spray the fields. And their game was how long could they stay in the fog of the chemicals. They would chase after the, the, dust, uh, uh, the crop duster, and they'd try and stay in as long as they could. So she thinks she got a pretty good exposure to pesticides that way, and that may have contributed. All right, so... Um, and then genetically, we're different. You know, we're not all identical. Some of us are really good detoxifiers. Others are not as good at detoxification. So what can we do? I've just given you the bad news. Let's talk about the things we can do to reduce our risk. The very first thing we want to do is take less of these toxins in. So I just said, you know, avoid those thermal receipts. We can avoid eating canned food, and especially perhaps during critical periods like pregnancy or young childhood. We can avoid drinking out of plastic, maybe not on the cruise, but remember the perfect is the enemy of the good. So in your day-to-day -day life, you can avoid plastic. So let's talk about the decision we make about food because food is one of the major ways that we absorb these environmental chemicals. So we can eat a plant-based diet. Um, as things get more developed, you know, a cow eats a lot of food, grains, um, whatever it's being fed, and it bioaccumulates some of the environmental toxins in those grains so that in its flesh, when you eat it, it may have more toxin. Whereas if you eat low on the food chain, you're going to be exposed to less. Uh, organic. Organic can make a really big difference. Who prioritizes organic in their diet? Okay, a number of you. Uh, but organic is one of the ways to really reduce the amount of pesticide that you're exposed to if we keep it meaningful. So in the United States, we have uh, organic laws, and they do count. And it's not so easy to get an organic designation. At the same time, there is a federal organic standards board, and they set what is allowed to be an organic food, and it's still call, called organic. So for example, when they first passed the standards, 74 different things could be included. So for example, baking soda. You know, that's a chemical compound. That's not organic. So if you were going to make a food that needed baking soda, you could include that and still call it an organic food. Now there's 470 allowable things that don't have to be organic and we can still call the food organic. So we have to advocate to be sure that this stays meaningful. We can avoid glyphosate. I mentioned this chemical the other day when I was speaking about vitality. Um, this is one of the chemicals in Roundup Ready. There are 16 different chemicals and Monsanto who produces this says it's perfectly safe. Um, however, you could see that not everyone would agree that it's safe. In 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer labeled it a, a probable carcinogen. And in 2017, uh, California, California is one of those states that's been very progressive about environmental concerns, uh, added it to the list of chemicals known to cause cancer. But there's a lot of it around. Look at that, 0.8 pounds per acre of cultivated land in the United States. So this is one of the problems. How do you avoid glyphosate? Organic is one way, and this is another. Uh, there's a non-GMO project, and if you see this label, that is a less expensive designation for companies to get, and so this is another way to reduce your risk. Who's familiar with the Environmental Working Group? Raise your hand. All right, every year they publicize a list of what they call the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. This is only produce, and it comes from USDA data. And um, you could see on these pictures some of the more commonly contaminated foods, so apples and celery and strawberries are almost always on there, and peaches. And 
when you eat these foods, these are foods that have a lot of pesticide contamination, as opposed to what we call the clean 15. These are contaminated. Now, we're not talking organic here. This is conventional food, the worst and the best. And so the Environmental Working Group estimated that if you purchased produce from the Clean 15 instead of the Dirty Dozen, you would eliminate 94% of the pesticides you'd been exposed to. Not everybody can afford organic. It's not accessible to everyone. So this is a decision you can make. You can print out these little wallet cards and you can decide that you're going to eat the produce that's less contaminated. All right, so I've talked about diet. That's good. If you change your diet, does it make a difference? Because, you know, all well and good for me to talk about organic and GMO-free, but does it make a difference? So I want to show you some research to suggest that it does. First, I'm going to show you an animal study. These two rats are genetically identical. Does that surprise anyone? They don't look identical, do they? These are agouti, and they have been bred to overeat, get fat, develop high blood pressure, heart disease, and cancer. And they're bred because that's a way that scientists can do research on these diseases and hopefully come up with more uh, solutions and cures. Why are they not identical? Even though they're genetically identical, they, they have a different phenotype, a different appearance. The reason is, is that when that brown rat was in its mother's womb, it was, uh, the mother was supplemented with B12 and folate. And that supplement reduced the expression of the agouti gene. So because of the additional B12 and folate, this rat did not develop what it had been genetically bred to develop. So that's an animal example. Here's a human example. This is a small study, five families in San Francisco who got freshly prepared catered food with minimal use of canned foods or plastics. And in just three days, their BPA and phthalate levels dropped dramatically. BPA by two thirds, phthalates by more than 50%. So this is encouraging. This means that when we change our diet relatively rapidly, we can get some of these chemicals out of our body. This is a really compelling study. And I know Sandy talked a little bit about ADHD and foods, and sometimes people poo-poo the importance of organic. But I hope the next time you hear this, you remember this study, and you can argue for the value of organic. So this was done at the University of Washington. There were 23 children between the ages of 3 and 11. And you could see there were three phases. First, they ate their conventional diet. Then they were put on organic food. Now, not healthy food. If they ate pretzels, they gave them organic pretzels. If they ate potato chips, they gave them organic potato chips. So it was a direct substitution of organic. And then they went back to their conventional diet. I think that's pretty dramatic. I think that slide kind of speaks for itself, that in just these few days, you can see how much the um, organophosphate, which is a kind of um, a pesticide, disappeared from their urine. And the authors concluded organic diets provide a protective mechanism against organophosphate pesticide exposure in young children. Such protection is dramatic and immediate. So this does work. There are lots more studies. but. I could spend, you know, half the day and then you'd miss your excursions. All right. Other reasons to eat organic. It's good for the environment. I mean, it cannot be good for us. They were spraying almost a pound of glyphosate on every acre of non-organic land. Sometimes there's more um, omega-3 in organic milk and organic meat. And you heard from Dr. Weil, having more omega-3 in the diet is a good thing. And then we also... Um, because you're not allowed to use antibiotics unless the animal is ill in organic, you are going to have less uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria that you're exposed to. But organic is not perfect. It doesn't address all of the issues. First of all, it primarily looks at pesticides and herbicides. So it doesn't address the fact that we take food, just imagine for a minute, a beautiful, pristine milk farm. The cows are grazing. Anyone drive through Petaluma, California, and you see those cows on the grass? It is just stunningly beautiful to drive there. So the cows are grazing. At the end of the day, the farmer leads them in and milks them, and then the milk goes through plastic tubing, and then it gets bottled in a plastic bottle. 
So is that good or bad? You know, I mean, we don't know. It's probably better than regular milk, but it's not perfect. Uh, it also doesn't always account for the soil. So we also want to think about the food containers that we use. And uh, give me an example of something you can do to, uh, to have a better food container. Use glass. Absolutely. Glass is inert. So you don't want to store your food in plastic, especially if it's oily or hot. So your newly cooked fresh tomato sauce, you want in glass because otherwise the acid in that tomato sauce is a really good way to pull some of the plastic chemical into the food. So let's now move on to water because that's another significant way that we are exposed uh, to a variety of things, um, both uh, pesticides but also now pharmaceuticals in our water. Uh, public service announcement, water, the healthiest choice, right? Uh, our government is starting to suggest this, and yet, at the same time, we have Flint, Michigan. And in Flint, Michigan, the city changed its water source uh, from the Detroit system to the Flint River, and then the children started having high lead levels, and a very smart pediatrician picked this up, and it became a huge embarrassment and a public health crisis. However, the CDC basically says 40% of states have lead test results that are higher than Flint. So we have a lot of lead, and we don't even know where it is. And good for Michigan. One of the things that they are doing, there's a law right now up in Michigan, they are going to require the municipal companies to find all of the lead and replace it so that kids aren't exposed. So what do you need to do? You need to filter water at the tap. And you can test your water. This is a, uh, a website, Healthy Babies, Bright Futures, because lead is the most significant risk for children, although in adults it increases our risk of heart disease. And again, maybe one of the reasons why we have unexpected heart disease. So you have choices when you filter your water. There's carbon filtration, there's reverse osmosis, and there's steam distillation. And most people do carbon filtration. If you have a, a water filter on your refrigerator, it's probably a carbon. They are pretty good. Reverse osmosis is probably the best, but it wastes a fair amount of water. So it depends where you live. So what happens with beverages? This is a study that was done at Harvard um, with 77 students, and they either got soda in these plastic polycarbonate bottles or they got soda at a glass. Um, and they, again, dramatic reductions in their BPA when they were off of those polycarbonate bottles. Okay, anybody wear makeup? This is another place where we get exposed with personal care products. The men are sitting and feeling really good about themselves because they mostly don't wear makeup. But you guys, six personal care products a day on average. Think shampoo, think if you use conditioner, think about deodorant or antiperspirant, aftershave. So you're also using these various things. And our skin is good at allowing us to absorb environmental chemicals. It's a really good vehicle. So what can you do about that? Well, again, I said I wouldn't have been able to give this talk a number of years ago. But this is one app. It's a free app called Healthy Living. There are two others called The Good Guide and Think Dirty. And you can put one of these apps on your phone and you can scan the barcode. And the, the app will tell you how it does in terms of these um, these chemicals. The chemicals can be allergens. They could be reproductive toxicants, which means they're dangerous when you're trying to have a child, men and women, or they can be carcinogens. We don't really want any of those. And so you can find um, products that are really clean. And there are products out there because there's an enormous green industry that's responding. So again, you change your products, does it make a difference? Well, let me show you a little study. This was done in Salinas, California, 100 girls aged 14 to 18 who volunteered to step away from their usual products and only use uh, products free of phthalates, parabens, and triclosan. And um, after three days, you could see dramatic reduction. So again, when we get cleaner products, we can do this. Now, I'm saying products, and sometimes you think, oh, but I love fill-in-the-blank mascara that may have lead in it or um, 
shampoo that has sodium lauryl sulfate and you just love that product so remember the perfect is the enemy of the good i have never met anyone who said i can't switch or i'm just so attached to this particular cleaner i use on the floor there are very good clean products that you can purchase and that are going to be um, uh, reduce your exposures I also want to mention electromagnetic fields. Probably um, because we're on this ship and we don't have a lot of internet, we're not carrying phones in the pockets. We're not sitting with laptops on our laps. But those are problems. And um, again, in San Francisco, uh, they now have ratings on cell phones because cell phones have also been declared potential carcinogens. What do you do about your cell phone? What, what reduces you to exposure from a cell phone? Speaker, yes. What else? Think about our kids. What are they always doing? Texting. Texting way better than having it up near your head. Keeping it a little further from your head makes a difference. Uh, putting it on airplane mode if you're not using it or if you're driving in a place where you're coming in and out of signal because that's going to increase the amount of signal. Uh, so the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends these kinds of steps to parents so that kids have less exposure. All right, so we talked about having less exposures, ingesting less. Can we detox more? Can we become more effective at detoxifying and eliminating these chemicals from our bodies? So this is earlier research. There's not as much of it, but I think it's provocative. So for example, this is a study of antioxidants and vitamin E and dietary flavonoids. And I've listed some of those dietary flavonoids. You could see they're healthy foods, parsley, onions, berries, bananas, citrus, also things we like, like red wine and dark chocolate. These are things that reduce heart cell damage from organic pollutants. So include them in your diet. Vitamin C, this was quite a small study, but 15 women who took 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day had reduced polychlorinated biphenyls, that's PCBs, or the organochlorine pesticides after they took the vitamin C. So these antioxidant vitamins look like they could help. This was a study that was done in a very polluted region of China. 291 people who got a broccoli sprout vet beverage. Now what does broccoli do in our body? Helps our liver detoxify. All of the cruciferous vegetables do that. So what are the other crucifers? Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage. cabbage. Yeah, so coleslaw counts, right? Kale. I mean, hopefully one of these is something that you like, and it's going to help your liver be more effective at detoxifying. So I would say, you know, if this talk has caused concern or additional concern for you, let's advocate for change. Let us spend our money in ways that increases this green movement. There wouldn't be all of these green products if it wasn't for people who wanted to, to purchase them. Um, and also, take some of the precautions. Think about organic. Think about the containers that you use in your house. Think about filtering your water and carrying your own. I think we can also make an economic case. Uh, this is Leo Trisson's work. And um, he uh, argues, he's a pediatrician in New York, and he has calculated that BPA is associated with 12,000 cases of childhood obesity and almost 34,000 new cases of heart disease in the United States in 2008, costing around $3 billion. And that if we took BPA out of food, which by the way, are any of you Canadian? In Canada, they, they did take BPA out of food. This is not something that we could not do as a society. But if we remove BPA, we could prevent 6,000 cases of obesity in children and 22,000 cases of heart disease and potentially save $1.7 billion. So sometimes it's better to make the economic case. Think about... Could an environmental chemical be a trigger for whatever I'm experiencing? Remember, I told you that patient story at the beginning. She was the detective. She was the one who came in thinking, this isn't right. So if you're a thin person who has high blood pressure and you think, I manage my stress, I exercise, why do I have this? Think about whether it could be, in part, due to environmental chemical exposure. And... Um, then what is it? You know, what's your work? You know, what are you exposed to in your work environment, in your home environment, and how can you reduce it? But don't make yourself crazy.
do the best you can without trying to get to perfect. And so um, these are my recommendations. I think it's really worth choosing organic if you can, uh, being sure to get low mercury fish. Those are going to be the smaller fish. Sometimes they're wild as opposed to farmed fish. Use the Environmental Working Group. They're a wonderful nonprofit. All of these, um, all of these tools I've mentioned are for free. Avoid GMO foods, canned foods. I said to limit rice because that's an exposure for arsenic. Um, and arsenic can show up in organic rice as well as uh, conventional rice. Make sure you're storing your food in stainless steel, glass, or ceramic. Filter your water. Think about your personal care products. Let go of the ones you're not really attached to and limit the amount of time you're exposed to electromagnetic fields. And um, some resources, you could take a picture of these if you want, um, or they're on the handout that I gave you. Uh, these are some terrific places to look things up. And our center, the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, has a six-hour course that we had philanthropic support to develop. It's available for free to any of you. And if any of you are planning to have a child or know someone who's planning to have a child, this is something that I uh, wrote about in a book, uh, Be Fruitful. Uh, to really help people have the healthiest children possible and minimize their exposure.